All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. It's 10 30. Yeah, four. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is gonna be fun, 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 fun. I am so glad. Sylvia, if it's okay with you, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Okay, perfect. All righty. Well, welcome, 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 everyone and our esteemed panelists. I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here today. We have a treat for you today. You will hear from some of our local leaders who are passionate about opening the conversation about diversity, inclusion, and equity in housing. My name my name is Janice Lovendahl. I am your SRCAR Housing Diversity Chair today, and our committee is on board here as well. But it is my pleasure. I do want to share with you today our mission and our objectives of developing this new, this new committee that we have at SRCAR. And our mission is, is to foster unity, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the real estate industry. That's our mission. And we have many goals that we want to achieve with this committee. And just to name a few, we want to provide education and resources to members and our community. And we also want to break down some of those barriers and celebrate the differences in our similarities alike. We want to foster an environment, an environment within our committee and our, com our, our community that enables our members and consumers to feel empowered, valued, and respected and safe. So I do want to say we want to be able to open the conversations, we want to have some trainings, and I want everyone here on the call today, we are all here in love. We're here to listen to some ideas and some opinions so that we can make a difference. We're going to, in, in June, and June is right now, it's what, it's Home Ownership Month, and also it's Pride Month. So I want to share with you all just a small snippet of a video that I found. It was by Jay Shetty, and it was Love Has No Labels. So let's take a listen to that real quick. I'm going to share this video with you. To open up. I'm a female, I'm a lesbian, but I'm also a pastor. Most of my congregation is white and straight. There's no place for me. If they weren't part of my world, I just didn't pay attention. On 12th June 2016, 49 humans were killed in a mass shooting at Pulse, a nightclub serving the gay community. The question I'm asking is, why does it take a tragedy for us to look for unity? I'm a gay pastor from the gay church, 1.4 miles from Pulse. It was devastating. As a pastor of a large church, I thought we're going to have lots of people calling in who were affected, no calls. I felt so horrible, not because I had so many relationships in that community, but because apparently I had none. Pulse changed everything. Truly different experiences. I guess my question is how you both became friends. The week of Pulse, two of the larger churches in town came together and did vigils for the LGBT community and they didn't include me. I was in this meeting. I'm thinking she's going to be nice and accommodating. We're all here for her community. We have been, as gay people, relegated to the margins. Invite us to the table. I love that strength and I want to get to know her. He met me here, and I knew then that I had an ally that I didn't know I would have. She really made it easy to be her friend. Just two very like-minded people that want to make a difference in the world. It's beautiful to go beyond those labels and beyond those categories. I'd love to hear how you coming together has impacted both your own communities. The year mark of the Pulse tragedy, the Reformation Project had asked if Dr. Hunter would have a conversation about LGBT inclusion. And of course I first said, well sure. And then I thought, how am I going to lead them in a way that's knowledgeable, that really would connect? So I invited a leader in that community. And he invited me to the table. And I said, this takes a lot of guts. <laughs> I did Facebook Live literally from the chair. It brought people from all over an opportunity to see what we're doing here locally. Your relationship isn't now just because you represent different areas. It's beyond that. It's about loving each other as people. Somebody will find hope merely because we're having the conversation. And that is the bottom line of what will change the future. Okay. 
All righty. I wanted to share that with you. And I wanted to know, did you pick up and, and pick up some of the words that were being said in this video? You know, love has no labels. There's no place for me. They didn't include me. Invite us to the table. If they weren't part of my world, I didn't pay attention. Love each other as people. Those are some powerful words that were shared in this video. This is a powerful video because it definitely does. It opens our eyes and say, you know, okay, just like when the, the pastor said, if they weren't part of my world, I didn't really pay attention. So we're going to talk about a few things just that we're realtors. And of course, we're going to be hitting more in regards to the uh, real estate industry and our community as a whole. But I do want to just ask everyone, just we're here all in love and we want to share some ideas and we want to share some points of what we can do and how we all can make a difference. Today, we have a wonderful, wonderful, outstanding member that's going to be our moderator today. It's Alan Okamoto. Some of you may already know who he is, but I do want to tell you guys just a little bit about him. He is the broker owner of T. Okamoto and Company. It is the largest Japanese American real estate agency in Northern California. He was elected president of the San Francisco Association of Realtors, the first Asian president in, his, in its first 100-year history. Named Realtor of the Year at the SFAR in 1991 and the Richard Sachs Lifetime Achievement Award. Director for Life by the California Association of Realtors and the recipient of the Distinguished Realtor Award in 2019. He was named by the National Association of Realtors as one of the 50 most influential realtors. He's also the founding chair of the Asian Real Estate Association of America and the recipient of the Person of the Year. Founding chair of the Asian Real Estate Association of, Real of America Foundation and currently He's the vice chair of our California Association of Realtors Fair Housing and Diverse Diversity Task Force. Let me please welcome you all to Alan Okamoto. Wow! Yay. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Janice. That was that was terrific. Thank you very much. You know, yeah. I I truly want to applaud uh, Jan Janice and her committee for putting this panel discussion together on diversity. Fortunately, we're having the discussion, but unfortunately, we're having this discussion. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of good things will come from it. Uh, there's one major problem with Janice. I think that she has to increase her passion. You have to increase your energy. Uh, you've got to liven things up, Janice. <laughs> no, of course, I'm, I'm obviously kidding. I know. You, you are the most wonderful person, wonderful chair. I think the uh, Southwest Riverside County Association is lucky to have you as a member and as the chair of this uh, diversity committee. So thank you very much. You know, due to uh, today's current social climate, the issues of fair housing and diversity are very, very important. So it is my honor and pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's panel discussion. As Janice mentioned, I currently serve as the vice chair of the California Association of Realtors Fair Housing and Diversity Task Force. The mission of the task force is to recommend initiatives and policies to strengthen the association's commitment to fair housing and diversity within the California housing market and the real estate industry. Due to the recent events over the past years, the California Association and all local associations are creating programs and initiatives to help our members understand and implement fair housing practices and create a diverse community. As I said, the Southwest Riverside County Association is on the leading edge for holding today's discussion. I think we can all agree that one of the best ways 
to build generational and community wealth is through home ownership. The benefits of home ownership have shown that families remain vibrant and healthy and communities grow stronger. Home ownership has been the American dream for many, but that hasn't always been the, the case for people of color and for members of the protected classes. Today, we have four outstanding individuals with tremendous backgrounds who will give us their thoughts and opinions on today's social climate. I will introduce each one and they will have two to three minutes to give opening remarks. After the introductions, they will be given some questions regarding building wealth through diversity. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will answer them if time allows. But first of all, I would like to introduce Amir Elahi. Well, that's the coolest name, I love that name. <laughs> Amir is a realtor, a consultant, an international speaker, and motivational life coach. He is present, he is the president of the Inland Valley Association of Realtors, a part of NARAB, the oldest African-American trade association in the country. Amir, why don't you give us your thoughts? Thank you, Alan. Um, it is great to be here today. I really appreciate Denise and the committee for asking me to be a, a part of uh, today's discussion. I think that coming from the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, um, again, we're celebrating 74 years this year. And so we've been having this discussion. Um, it's been a part of our daily lives. And so what we're glad is that you know, associations like the Southwest Riverside Association, the California Association of Realtors, as well as the National Association of, of Realtors are now having this discussion. And, and just a little bit of background on us, and, and I shared it, and I share it often, you know, even from a national standpoint, you know, the National Association of Realtors, uh, although they'll be celebrating nearly 100 years, it was just in 1966 that they admitted the first African-American member. Um, and so while we have great, we've made great strides, we still have great opportunities to really make an impact that will last beyond um, you know, our current generations. And that's what I believe that we're all striving to do. So I'm glad to be able to lend a hand and help in any way I can. Okay, thank you very much, Amir. And next we have Anthony Vulin. Anthony is a member of the LGBTQ Real Estate Alliance and is a chapter leader for Los Angeles. And he is a national social media and education chair. In 2013, Anthony left Keller Williams and launched his own boutique real estate company in West Hollywood called The Collective. And in 2014, he opened up a second office in Silver Lake. The Collective is the only brokerage in LA that is certified by the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce as being an LGBTQ business enterprise. Anthony, why don't you give us your comments? Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Um, Janice, I love that you played uh, the video that you did to start us off and um, just wanted to maybe mention a bit about that. You know, when we talk about diversity, a lot of it's about um, the color of your skin, but being LGBTQ is um, different than that. And um, there's no, you know, I guess no religion that I really know of that says that um, because of the color of your skin, you should, you know, um, that you're not accepted in our religion. Um, that because of the color of your skin, our religion will not allow you to be married. Um, that because of the color of your skin, it's a sin. And um, unfortunately, with the LGBTQ community, that's still present in um, many of the most popular um, populist religions that are out there. So it's still it's still a tr it's still a struggle. I mean, when religion is the center of your life and the most important thing, and um, your spirituality, and it's telling you that it's wrong and that this is not something that you should be accepting, we have a long way to go. Um, and it just, it makes it really, really uh, difficult, and we still have these struggles. So, I mean, I can remember just a few years back when my sister uh, was getting married, and I just, 
I knew, you know, I looked at her and she looked so beautiful and there's 300 person wedding. And I, I just knew I'd never be able to have this and have a wedding in the church. And I'm Catholic and um, the church that I've grown up going to, I would never be able to have that in my life. And, um, you know, when I was 36, finally, the United States said that you can actually get married. And um, so I am engaged and I'm getting married next year and um, have a small wedding planned. And I'm excited about that. And my family's super supportive, but it's still something I'm not able to do uh, within my own faith and religion in the church. And um, so it, it's a little bit different. You know, I just wanted to bring that up to keep that in mind with everyone that, um, you know, you don't always know when you're looking at someone if they're part of the LGBTQ community just by the way that they look. And um, we have a lot of work to go. The home ownership rate in the LGBTQ community is 16% below the national average. And the main mission of the Real Estate Alliance is to help narrow that gap um, through education. Uh, and that's something I'm ex extremely passionate about is bringing that education uh, to our community. And um, like Alan and Jana said, you know, one of the ways that we have to bring value back to our consumers as realtors um, is educating them about home ownership and helping uh, level the playing field for everyone to have the experience of the American dream. So thank you for having me part of this panel. I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say and learn from you all as well. Uh, that is terrific. Congratulations, Anthony. I think that you ought to put your marriage on Zoom and invite us all, okay? <laughs> sure. I know, I'm waiting on my invitation. <laughs> it's in Maui, so it's, you know. I'm really definitely... waiting on my, yeah. No, I'm okay. really waiting on my invitation. <laughs> no, forget, forget the Zoom. I'm going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> it's in Hawaii. <laughs> you know, I, I just wanted to mention, I'm so pleased that these four organizations are represented here today. You know, I've been in real estate a long, long time. And just a few short years ago, local associations and CAR and NER would not have NAREP, ARIA involved in any discussion at all. So having this discussion today with all you four folks is really heartwarming and, and wonderful. Um, so next we have, I, I was being very politically incorrect. I had the males go before the uh, women. So I apologize. Next we have Adriana Burris. Adriana has been serving her community in real estate, serving the community real, her community real estate needs since 2003. And she's been very busy uh, raising three children. She is the founding member of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, NAREP, of the Te Temecula Valley ch chapter. She is committed to sharing NAREP's messages, including the NAREP 10, which I believe she will discuss in depth later. Okay, Adriana, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Ellen. And we're so grateful to have you here with us today. Really appreciate your time. And, um, and I'm excited to be here. Congratulations, Anthony, too, to you as well. That's exciting news for you. And Amir and Anne, um, just great to see you guys and, and have everybody be on here. And thank you to all of our community that's joined us today. Um, that says a lot about everybody kind of pulling together. So um, I just wanted to do a little short intro on our organization, um, NAREP, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, for those of you that aren't familiar um, with it, and give a little bit about our mission statement. Uh, NAREP is a purpose-driven organization that's propelled by a passionate combination of entrepreneurial spirit, cultural heritage, and the advocacy of its members. Our mission is to advance sustainable Hispanic homeownership, and we accomplish that mission by educating and empowering the real estate professionals who serve Hispanic home buyers and sellers, advocating for public policy that supports the trade association's mission, and facilitating relationships among industry stakeholders, real estate practitioners, and other housing industry professionals. We started our chapter here in um, the Temecula Valley chapter in the end of 2017. And uh, NAREP is the largest nationwide Latino business organization. We have over 40,000 members and over 100 chapters, and we still continue to grow. So uh, we're excited to be present here in the Temecula Valley and still continue to grow and um, just build our relationships with each other and, and help uh, everybody get information as to how we can accomplish our missions together. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, next, we have, as they say, last but not least, Ann Wicker. Ann is currently the sales manager at Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. 
She has 25 years experience in business development and relationship management. She received her MBA and Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communication in the Philippines, the Cebu, Philippines. She was the 2018 ARIA San Diego chapter president and is active with the Women's Council of Realtors. And how about your thoughts? Thank you, Alan. I am uh, really happy to be here and see all of you guys. I, I can't wait to hear from each of you. Um, especially, I have participated for most of the organizations and, and served for uh, quite many of years, but there's always a learning pattern every year. We learn something new. I'm really, really humbled to be a part of this event and represent ARIA as well. To those of you who are not familiar, ARIA has over 17,000 members and about 41 chapters that's in the US and also um, international. We have chapters in Canada and in Asia. Um, we have for uh, San Diego, it's been there for now 12 years and I was fortunate enough to serve in 2018 as president and learned so much. And today, um, as we go through, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions, but as an immigrant uh, coming from the Philippines in 2002, here in the US, I would uh, want to suggest two words and two things that I want us to not just think about, but take it away from each of us is, one is consider, uh, for me personally, ignorance, being an immigrant to the country. And second, that I want to make sure we, we think about, and this is in line to diversity, is roots. If we understand those two, um, the, our ignorance and coming from where we're at, um, from our roots, I think we can have more um, understanding and unity as a group. And I think that we can also respect from uh, because of where we come from, we may have different views, and it doesn't mean it's bad. Um, different views means additional learning um, for everyone. Thank you. Wow, very terrific words. Thanks, Anne. That, that's wonderful. Uh, we all, all of you represent uh, diverse minority organizations, and I think some of you may have covered this uh, question in your opening remarks, but I just wanted to find out um, can you tell us what your organization can do or are doing to promote wealth building through diversity since that is the topic of our discussion? So I just, I'll open up to any one of you if you have any thoughts on building community wealth through diversity. Anybody um, can I, jump in. For Thank like you. Just, just a quick comment. Um, we've had a lot of success with um, putting on homebuyer seminars. So um, we don't call them first time homebuyer seminars anymore, it's just homebuyer seminars um, through Zoom, just teaching people the very basics of how to get started and how to get on the path to building wealth um, through uh, tips to improving your credit to um, different down payment options that are available. And I mean, I was surprised when I started this at how many people had no idea what an FHA loan was and that you could buy in certain areas with zero down um, and three and a half percent down with FHA loans. Uh, many people think that you need to have 20% down. So just getting that word out is helping our community uh, get into home ownership sooner than they thought they might have ever been able to do. Um, and we also throw a home buyer fair where we bring in all different types of vendors who are part of the home buying process uh, invite people in to talk to them, to ask questions, um, and learn, you know, what it what it takes to purchase a home. Um, you know, what happens during a home inspection? Um, is staging right for you if you're possibly wanting to sell? Uh, different lenders that are there with their programs and so on, and make it a really fun event. And um, we did it right before COVID, and now we're looking to start that again because we had um, quite a good success in our from our LA chapter, and we're starting to spread that around the country. Now I'm planning for um, fall homebuyer fairs um, out in a public area just to invite the community. So anyone who's walking by is welcome to come in. That's great words, Anthony. Thank you very much. So Adriana, does that uh, 
NAREP 10 have anything to do with building community wealth? Uh, can you explain? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that we have a, also on NAREP.org website, we have um, the State of Hispanic Homeownership Report, which was released recently. And that's available. I think we, we were going to put a link for that um, in there. But it's a wealth of information with regards to how our home buyers um, can start and the statistics that they show with regards to building wealth. Um, as, as you mentioned, a lot of that comes from home ownership. Um, one of the biggest statistics in there is that between 2020 and 2040, 70% of new homeowners will be Latino. And it's a huge statistic and that's a huge step forward uh, in the direction to building wealth. And on NAREP.org website as well, we do have the NAREP 10, which are 10 disciplines that were created um, Part of the as part of the Hispanic Wealth Project. And they are all about building wealth um, in our community. And they're really disciplines though that anybody can follow and should be following on a daily basis. Um, you can see them on our website, but I can certainly run through them real quick, just if you'd like. Um, we do carry around our, we have a little card that we can <laughs> address, um, just to introduce people to them because they're something that everybody can live by. Um, number one, of course, I don't have my glasses on. Um, have a mature understanding of wealth and prosperity. Number two, be in the top 10% of your profession. Number three, live below your means and be ready for the next recession. Number four, to minimize debt. Number five, to invest at least 20% of your income in real estate and stocks. Number six, know your net worth, including the value of your business. Number seven, to be politically savvy. Number eight, be physically fit. Number nine, to be generous with people who are less fortunate. And number 10, be active in the lives of your family and children. And all of that together helps us build, um, you know, us in the right direction of building wealth and community wealth and being in the top of your profession, as we talk about, um, encouraging your family as well. And I think collectively through, through local efforts as well with our chapters, we put on events um, with regards to educating the other uh, real estate professionals in our community, um, how to help owner help, excuse me, help homeowners um, purchase, you know, their homes, um, how to help each other foster those relationships and to support each other. Um, biggest thing too is education. And, you know, with especially with lending and everything changing, especially over last year, different products that are available. And I think that we just do that by supporting each other and um, building those relationships and seeing how we can navigate through through all of that to help each other out. Wow, well, that's that's terrific. I think uh, in the chat somebody requested that you put the, those ten points in the in the chat. Or if, okay, uh, Denise, you can distribute them. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Amir, do you have any thoughts about building community wealth through diversity? Well, it really is. I love what um, what Anthony and uh, Adriana said and. Um, we're, we're definitely have, have been subscribing to the uh, NARAP 10 for quite a long time. Um, one of the things that we're doing as well is really helping. One of the things that we found, uh, we have a um, state of housing in Black America report also. Um, it's called the Sheba report. And what we've been able to identify is that, of course, since the last market crash, you know, the, the African American homeownership has dipped some 15% uh, from that 2019 to 2020, there was less than a 1% increase. Um, and so what we're doing is we're also really trying to educate our professional community. And so the idea is to really help people understand some of those same programs that are out there that are available so that they can share that information within the community that the professionals are actually working in um, I talked uh, back in February about the Inland Empire Association of Realtors, and we cover two of the largest counties in the country. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is bring realtors together uh, to help uh, incentivize and to educate them on how to go back to their various communities and talk about the down payment assistance programs, to partner with nonprofits, um, as well as to be able to take advantage of a great program that we've started at the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, which is actually a program to bring in um, realtors from 18 to 35 and actually help them with getting educated, 
what helped into getting their license, as well as paying some of their our early uh, association dues, perhaps to, to actually increase the number of um, realtors that are uh, in our communities helping with this education. Wow, very good, very good, Amir. Thank you very much. And do you have any thoughts on uh, this question about building community wealth through diversity? And you're on mute right now. Thank you, Alan. Um, I would like to share, I, I have served um, ARIA, which is the Asian Real Estate Association of America since 2011. And I would say it's truly a great part of my growth um, other than the profession that I do uh, in the lending industry. And that is because a great amount of wealth is really not just from um, your educational background, but from experience and dealing with different people. In joining ARIA, I have learned so much, including coming from the different leaders, uh, their backgrounds, and it kind of led me to uh, serving the board uh, in that way, because for, from where I come from, what I learned, and the education, I wanted to give it back. Um, just a quick facts: these information are also available online, but I wanted to share with you the organization um, uh, as a nonprofit is here to serve the uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Um, and in that we, we try and give you some of the, um, the backgrounds. Like right now there's, this is as of 2020, we have over oh, 19 you million so uh, in population of the AAPI or the Asian American and Pacific Islander. That's about 5.9% of the population in the US. So if you think about that chunk, um, that there is a great opportunity of the population that not only we can serve as for the home ownership but uh, in education as well. And in this uh, population, the Asian American housing rate is over 57%. So if you're serving the real estate community and you have not um, uncovered that um, opportunity, I think it's about time to, to take a look at that. And I believe for uh, each of them, uh, for these buyers, they're averaging um, her, their home ownership is averaging around four, over 400,000 in uh, pricing. So the reason why I run these numbers is um, it is high, but th there's still a great amount of those population are actually uh, hindered by uh, the limitations, right? So I wanna talk about Aria's three-point plan. Um, the three-point plan, the first one is, uh, maintaining access to affordable lending to the AAPI community. And that's uh, affordable lending that's served by our GSEs or government uh, sponsored enterprise. The, uh, a lot of them uh, are not able to access because they don't know that it's uh, available. And so ARIA is committed to making sure uh, that it's available and also um, available to them, not just access to this, but get them uh, also spread uh, for the whole community. The second one is um, reforming credit scoring uh, models to increase access to credit because of um, our uh, thin clean files applicants. So some of the, uh, most of the new um, young Americans and especially it also affects the AAPI community who have, um, if you're immigrants, you have less credit history. And also um, we come from, for the AAPI, we come from the culture of um, not using credit because we're raised to use cash. Um, like me, when I moved to the country, I've, I've never known what credit card means. <laughs> and then, you know, when your husband tells you, um, please use this credit card because you need your scoring. When you purchase your car, when we purchase home, you need to have credit history. And uh, I didn't have understanding to that, right? And so uh, ARIA is committed to 
making sure we're continuing. Actually, we go to Washington DC once a year to propose uh, different things to be sure and we can, um, we can serve this community that has limited uh, credit history, right? Um, the last point of the three-point plan is the better understanding and serving the needs of limited English proficiency. So uh, in the AAPA community, some of them, or most of them actually understands English, but prefers when it comes to lending and real estate contract, they prefer to have these uh, in their language um, for, for two reasons. One is culturally we're bound to to go with a deal that we understand in our own language. And then secondly, um, even, we, even if we can speak English, we wanna know that what we're getting into in the contract and the questions we ask is uh, something that is um, presented to us in our language. And so Aria continues to um, go uh, do all the different initiatives to cater to this three-point plan. And um, I hope that you also look into it. There's more da data that's really, really um, helpful. It helped me um, since I learned that this was available uh, to us. I actually have been using this every year. I look forward to looking at the latest. And like I mentioned, if you have not uncovered the opportunity for this community, um, just so you know, in that over 19 million in population uh, in the U.S., actually a majority of them are in California. So um, thank you for letting me share that and I uh, look forward to seeing your questions as well. Okay. Thanks, Anne. Aria is lucky to have you also. You know, this question is for Anthony. <clears throat> During my year as uh, president-elect of the San Francisco Association of Realtors, I gave it a lot of thought of what programs and initiatives I wanted to implement during my year as president. I wonder um, what surprises you have for Los Angeles. Yeah, so um, I'm excited to serve. We're about 12,000 member association. And, um, you know, one thing I think that we've really failed at as realtors is getting the message out about all the different types of lending programs that are available in order to help people get into homeownership who didn't think they could. Um, so like the Alliance is doing, I'm gonna implement a lot of the same programs. We're putting together uh, templates that different brokerages are gonna be able to use to put on home buyer seminars, um, as well as doing several home buyer fairs for our association as well. Um, but I really found out that, you know, that one of the number one reasons why um, people were not getting into homeownership and building wealth is that they truly thought that they had to have 20% down. And um, we all know as realtors that that's just not true. So we need to do a much, much better job of getting that word out in order to help people build wealth. Um, you know, LA is kind of at a 50-50 level right now of homeowners versus renters. And as that shifts to be more renters than homeowners, um, you know, to me that just says down the road, that's going to be problems for this, a city who's predominantly renters um, as far as helping these people to build wealth. And we know that the number one correlation to really having um, wealth and intergenerational wealth is through home ownership. So we have to take that seriously and do whatever we can to um, get more people into home ownership. Uh, one thing like specifically that we're really looking at as well is um, a very specific program is um, tenants in common uh, units where there's um, opportunities to convert um, current rental units into home ownership opportunities um, through tenants in common. And um, that's something that's really interesting. It's really starting to take off in LA. Um, there's a few companies, including mine, the collective that are, um, have been really doing that. And um, I think that's another opportunity that um, I'm going to be focusing on in our association is just build wealth, help our citizens build wealth through homeownership. So uh, thanks, Alan, for that question. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you very much. I wish you the greatest success. You know, 12,000 members is an awful lot. I, I think when I was president, we had 3,500. So mm. it was a lot easier to control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this question it would be for everybody, for the three of you. Uh, in the early years of ARIA, 
I got a call from the president of the National Association of Realtors. This was in our second or third year. And uh, he wanted me to sunset ARIA. He wanted us to fold into the National Association of Realtors. And of course we didn't. And I don't know the real reason why he wanted us to cease, uh, whether it was because he didn't think we were worth it or was he afraid of the competition, I'm not sure. But um, some people say that having minority organizations hinder diversity. Do you think that this is true or false? And if so, why? So I'll open up to the three of you. What do you think? Does it hinder diversity? Do you think having uh, not rep? Okay, I, Anthony, I, go I, ahead. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, and it's so interesting that, you know, a lot of our state and national associations haven't fully embraced the other organizations. Like you're saying, is it because they're afraid of the competition? I, I don't know. But I mean, I hope after what we've gone through over the last year mm -hmm. that they see that it's absolutely needed and we can all work together and we all do something different. And, um, you know, I sit on the diversity tax task force for CAR with Alan. And one of my, you know, big passions is we have to get California Association of Realtors to speak with all of the diverse associations that are out there to learn from them on what it is that we should be doing, what it is that, that the diverse organizations need who have their feet on the ground and who are mostly in touch with the issues in their own communities and bring that to CAR and let CAR help at a bigger level, um, not have CAR create their own plans reach out to the people, reach out to us who are already out here doing that. So I think it's needed. Um, I hope that NAR and CAR will include all of our organizations at all of their main meetings, um, you know, moving forward and help expose that we're actually here. So we are able to get more members and help, um, you know, our uh, diversity initiatives to be heard at a much bigger level. We all just need to support each other. We're all very different if we all need each other. Very well said. Uh, Adriana or Anne, do you have any comments about minority organizations? Are they good, bad, or what? So I noticed that um, there are people who tries to go to each one of them and then they're going to observe wh which one will stick in, right? And so um, I like the fact actually that at least they would try out to these different organizations and stick with one because at the end of the day, it's also not possible to be involved in all of them. Um, that's the first one. It kind of, for me, we have, we have to create balance. And also I like the fact that at the end of the day, you're going to focus on um, the organization that is going to allow you to thrive and brings out the best in you and be successful at what you do, right? So some of them that doesn't go to certain organizations doesn't really mean they don't like to be there. It's just kind of a time thing, right? But also um, I've noticed that um, there are times uh, these, there you go. There are times that um, when you find the organization that clicks into the format of your you know, business model or the format of how you try to grow personally and also try to grow your um, network professionally and, and personally, it means sometimes that we have to pick and choose, but um, be careful with the things or the words that we say, right? Um, I just, I'm grateful that a lot of them are made available for a lot of different counties these days, as opposed to before. For me, it was, it was limited when I started and now we're growing chapters in every corner. And, um, you know, thankfully for me, I don't have issues with just focusing on one. And I think Denise and Jenny's can, can say that. So I, you know, I even, uh, added the American Heart Association to be part of it because it's supported by my community of not just the lenders, but also the, the real estate and, and anybody serving in the housing uh, community. And it goes down to uh, what I said before, sometimes uh, it comes down to our roots, right? How we, how we were raised and how we um, deal with people and considering how we want to grow personally and our business. Very good. 
Adriana, any comments about minority organizations? Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> I mean, I have seen where some, for some it, it does hinder, but I think that those that are feeling that way, it's kind of the mindset that they have, right? Like they're not necessarily open. And I think that that's what we need to kind of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, help, just kind of help educate and let them see what it's all about because we're not trying to be separate from each other. I know some of the conversations I've had are, well, you know, if we allow you, then we're gonna have to allow this one and this one, well, what's the matter with that, right? We're better together. And I think that by us supporting each other and our, our organization supporting each other, we're not trying to separate ourselves out from each other, but rather just grow more together and we can help each other out. I know that in our community, when we started our chapter um, of NAREP here in Temecula Valley, we, we really had no idea what the response was going to be. Um, you know, we were familiar with the organization because um, it's been around for so long, but we had no idea what the response was going to be in our community. And I can tell you that it has brought out an enormous amount of people in our real estate industry that, that I had never met before. And I've been here locally for 17 years. Um, it's brought out a whole different just a just a whole different you know set of people that I think were that have been here for a while, but we're open to seeing you know how we can come together, um, how we can celebrate each other's cultures, how we can just foster those relationships and, and start new ones. And um, I'm so grateful for the people that I've met because I never would have met them otherwise um, without the organization. And there and there and I don't look at you know even other realtors. I don't look at them as competitors. I think it's we all learn from each other. And, and that's the great thing about these organizations, when you're going and you're networking and you're building these relationships, um, you're there to help each other and support each other. And I feel that that's what we can do with the other organizations as well. So, um, you know, I think it's just, and, and ultimately I think it starts at home. I mean, we talk about having a seat at the table, um, but I think it's important to have a seat at our dinner table with our kids and start the foundation there because that's how we grow and, and have those open mindsets to everybody and, and to know that we're all the same at the end of the day, so. Exactly, very well said, Adriana. You know, there's yeah, a- I don't know, I I'd like to add just to- Oh, sure, there you are. There. Um, you know, one of the things that people talk about is, is kind of removing the, the diversity lines because we are all together. And, and the reality of it is, is that, that we've got to act that way so that the lines could actually be removed. And, and, and we just as a country, you know, have, have had a challenge. I love the progressive thought that says, hey, we don't need these organizations or we don't need to identify ourselves with that. And I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that. The challenge is, is that, that in a lot of our industries and in a lot of our education, um, a lot of our housing specifically, housing and banking, there is a difference. And so let's eliminate the things that make it different so that the organizations aren't necessarily um, necessary anymore. And exactly. I'll just share with our, with, with you know, the African-American community, you know, every, every community has different kind of touch points. And so, you know, for years and years and years in the African-American community, it's been the church. You know, and so when the National Association of Realtors, you know, starts to actually connect with the church, uh, which is a huge rallying point, um, when the California Association of Realtors starts to connect with the church or have different understandings of where people are connecting and how you're going to reach people with the message. So I have no issue with the message. The idea is the method of how we're getting to those that need to hear the message and then what we're doing once we get there. And I think that that really is, again, I'm always seeing opportunity um, and, and challenges, but the fact is, is that we've, we're sitting in a great place today that if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I'd say, eh, I'm not sure. But because of the things that we've been through as a society and frankly, as a world, we really, really see two things. Number one, we're all the same. And number two, we're all, we all got different things um, in being the same and that's okay. And the, the opportunity is to be able to say, well, how do they do it in that community and, and how can I be a part? 
And that's where the great opportunity is. Well, I love your optimism. Thank you very much. I'm so glad you're back with us. You were gone for a little while. <laughs> I am double booked today, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> that's okay. We're all busy folks. You know, I, I'm truly glad that you're back because um, this sort of next question or comment is uh, related to a lot of the African-American communities, but there's a book entitled The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. I mean, it was such an eye-opening book for me. I never realized, I mean, I knew, but I didn't know. But he talks a lot about generational wealth, and that's the topic of today's discussion, that the African-American community really suffered terribly for the lack of generational wealth because of outright discrimination, bias, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I'm sure that the uh, Latinx community and the gay community and uh, the Asian community suffered from uh, this issue of generational wealth. I, can you folks uh, expand upon that? Wow. Well, the, the, the color of the, 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 the book by Richard, man, was and actually the Chicago um, area uh, National Association of Real Estate Brokers, the Chicago Realtors actually had a panel um, and Richard was actually there. So I got to hear from him um, during National Realtors Week uh, back in April. And it was uh, mind blowing, uh, to, to say the least. And I think that, you know, again, not that we're going to drum up and draw out these things and beat a dead horse, but the fact is, is that we've got a reckoning to, to actually, that we, that we actually owe a debt to, to these communities. And what the, the studies further show is not only did it rob the African-American community of generational wealth, but it also cost billions of dollars to the entire economy. So if it was an issue of just saying, hey, and I know there's a big push for you know, reparations and people are saying, hey, I didn't do it, so I shouldn't have to pay. But when we as, as African-Americans, as LGBTQ, as um, Latinx, as Asian-Americans, when we're all whole at the table, then everybody benefits. So it's not, a, it, and I know people will push back and go, well, yeah, but then if, and I think I heard Adriana say it, well, if we do that for African-Americans and we got to do this for Latinx and then we got to do this for LGBT, that's not it. The fact is when you actually do it and you lift, there, there's, a, there, there's an old quote that says, a rising tide lifts all boats. Now we've quoted that for years, but when it comes to equality and generational wealth and restoring generational wealth or destroying systems that limit or eliminate generational wealth, then we don't want to go back to that quote. And I'll give you a classic. So you may have been privy to it and you've seen it. If you've been watching the news, it's still happening now in appraisals. So it was in the Bay Area where African-American family their property was appraised half of nearly half of what it was actually worth until they took down their family photos and had a white family stand in. So it not, it's not just what HUD did and the redlining from 50 years ago or 75 years ago. We're talking today. And so um, we've got to be better. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So uh, the other panelists, any comments about generational wealth? Um, I, I have just a quick comment. Um, I think for the LGBTQ community, the, it's a little bit different. Um, a lot of people that I know, um, their families who had properties would not leave it to their kids if they were LGBTQ. They were just kind of cut out. Um, that's one issue that's changing now, but over the last, you know, 30, 40 years, that was uh, very, very common. Um, also, one of the number one correlators to homeownership is marriage. And marriage in the LGBTQ community is new. <laughs> so um, the homeownership awareness and um, narrowing that homeownership gap of 16% is going to start happening, I believe, just because marriage is allowed now. So hopefully that 
also changes things. Um, and then with the discrimination issue, like, you know, Mira's talking about, it's, it's out there still with LGBTQ community as well, where um, it's very easy to see, you know, two buyers who are writing an offer, if they're two guys or two girls, um, it's happened to me, to people in my office, um, you know, the agent on the other side even said like, you know, the seller just wanted to have a family come into this property or, you know, they're very traditional. They wanted to have another, um, you know, they're Chinese. They wanted to have another Chinese family come into their property. Um, so like, you know, things like that are still happening with all of us. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, the love letters that agents write uh, from buyer to seller um that's been a big discussion this year right and like is that right or is that wrong I don't know if we'll talk about that this at all but um I advise my clients to be very careful and only advise them to write it if I know for sure that what they're writing is going to help if it's a question or I don't know I'm like you know be very generic <laughs> don't say too much so that's it any of the other panelists comment on generational Okay, since none, but now I'll turn it to the panelists. Oh, Adriana, you wanted to say something? Well, well, I think just the most important thing with regards to that, because I think culturally speaking, um, you know, growing up as a child, we didn't really talk about building generational wealth, or we didn't really talk, I mean, in my household, we didn't talk about finances. And so I think that kind of one of the most important things with regards to being able to build that and educate our our generations to come on that is just having those conversations and having those conversations kind of going back to what I said, you know, at the dinner table, even with your family and your kids. And, um, you know, these days are so different with, you know, us as parents working so much, um, but you kind of got to just relate it all to the kids and, and what it's all about setting the future. And I think that all of these organizations collectively with regards to their conventions and regards to their events that they have, um, it's all about, ultimately, you know, home ownership, which is a part of building wealth, but kind of being able to share that with our kids too and say, okay, this is, you know, how you get from here to here and, and set them up because our, the generations are so different. And um, I think it's just having those open conversations and even getting your kids kind of involved too in, in seeing what the topics are and the content and the value um, that it brings. So just kind of going back to the simple things of educating and those open conversations. So sure, of course. Do you have any comments about that, Anne, or not at all? Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, back to where we come from, um, it's not discussed all the time building the uh, the wealth, but it's more like uh, from our culture is avoiding debts, um, <laughs> uh, pay cash at you know at most of the times and. Uh, of course, moving here, it's different, right? So you can have cash, you, you could also buy cash, but if you want to build your wealth in um, investing in real estates and, and getting your first home and, and growing into being a renter, um, it doesn't help, right? To just, you know, pay, pay it all uh, cash. So uh, it's, a, it's a learning pattern, but um, also, I think for, for us, my, my biggest learning was going through and being in the, in the lending industry is that uh, where I come from, we're huge on not doing uh, student loans. You know, our parents saved a lot for that. We are educated. Um, it's like college is a must have, <laughs> no matter what you do. Um, but we were raised not to to have a student loan, right? And now I'm realizing how much that helps or not, not helpful to those who have it uh, in qualifying to get a home, right? But what I'm also learning is that more and more families are actually um, learning that it's having the student loans can be a hindrance to uh, home ownership. And so more and more families are uh, staying away from that and uh, just kind of focusing on what they can afford. And um, together, I think we are growing our wealth by being aware of those factors. Okay, thank you, Anne. You know, I think it's time now to uh, see if we have any questions from the uh, other members. Uh, Denise, do you have uh, some questions in the chat for the uh, panelists? Um, I think right now, Alan, we had just one in here that was talking about, um, I guess, when we were talking about 
uh, the names on the purchase contract being, you know, uh, a he and a he and a she and a she, it says uh, they're wondering how does the panelists feel about having buyers' names and um, not removed from the contract? And with that, late, with that level, the playing field as far as purchasing a home. And uh, also they wanted to see if there was any thoughts in regards to the lending side of that, whether or not, you know, trying to eliminate some of those things so that they're not discriminated against on the lending side as well. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would eliminate a lot of issues for ethnic class names, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of levels. If there's a way to do that on that first initial offer, have the names not be present, I, I think that's a, I've never thought about that before. I don't know if it's possible, but that's interesting thought. I like that. <laughs> um, me being in the lending industry, though, we cannot, you know, discriminate the he or she in the contract, right? So, um, good thing as far as uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac goes, all of those are welcome and cannot be denied of, of a loan, right? Um, I think where for me it, it starts is, uh, especially the way the market is right now, is very, very competitive. Um, unfortunately, some of the sellers are, are still looking at that, which is really surprising to me. At least it's very, very minimal, but I have seen those where... Uh, the seller is like, okay, we, we prefer this um, as opposed to is it, it is a solid buyer, right? Um, but from the lending standpoint, the way the 1003 works is, is very clear. Um, we cannot deny anybody of a loan. If they're buying as a couple, whether they're both males or both females, um, they, as long as they are credit and income qualified, everything else does not matter, which is, I think... Um, should be uh, that way. Okay, so that was the only question we had, Janice. Yeah, I think that was the only question. And I think in the lending area, I don't know. Oh, Amir, did you have something you wanted to comment on that? I was gonna say, I think we have a responsibility when it comes to that as, as an industry. And I think that that is again, a great opportunity to be able to stand up and literally educate our sellers. And so I'm, I'm super, um, I won't say aggressive, but, but I'm not shy um, because I do have those conversations with my sellers. And I'm simply saying to them, you know, if, if you keep going down this road, you're part of the problem. We've got to educate our sellers to be better. Um, and you know what? At some point, it may cost me business. And if it does at the at the cost of educating a seller about how to make our world better, then so be it. But we've got a reason that a lot of that persists is because we as agents don't stand up. And we just, again, we've got to be able to say, hey, as an industry, you know, a lot of this persists because, and I understand about feeding your family, but also as a man of faith, I'm going to believe that if I, get passed over for business or I lose business for doing the right thing, then I haven't lost anything at all. Right. I think one of the key things, what key words that uh, everybody has mentioned is education. We have to educate our members. We have to educate our clients. Uh, the California Association of Realtors, as uh, Anthony mentioned, has instituted the uh, Fair Housing and Diversity Task Force. And one of the major implement uh, programs that we're going to implement is education. So if, if we as realtors can't uh, be educated, we can't educate our clients. And uh, I think that's very important. So do any of your panelists have any questions or topics that you want to ask each other or mention? So the floor is yours now. And um, I, I wanted to add something that Amir said. I, I love that... Um, you explain how sometimes we got to go past our uh, business uh, reasons, right? And like as a, as a man of faith and a lot of our uh, audience actually was talking about uh, education. So uh, two things, uh, part, of the, part of the reason why I served the board for ARIA was I really wanted to increase education for homeowners, but also uh, the realtors 
introducing them to affordable lending. A lot of times it can be, um, it can be hard uh, to let your strategic partners and friend realtors know about all these things because the way the market has been, you would be discouraged to do affordable lending because at the end of the day, let's admit it, you know, the, the deals or the offers that are accepted are the ones that are 20% down or more, right? And so we have to remember sometimes that a home ownership for the least of the people that can only afford, you know, 3% down, um, sometimes they go through the, the um, down payment assistance. We have to also uh, serve them. And I think uh, it comes down to when your sellers have been educated that these offers exist, um, uh, if they understand it's a solid loan, but just doing the 3% down, uh, we will have a better, you know, transaction. But uh, also remember our um, goal of making sure that our home buyers have access to affordable lending. We need to educate them about that. Uh, the grants available, the down payment assistance available. We need to continue to show them, you know, access to this. And while it is available, actually, you know, especially in California, I know that at one point they run out of funds, but right now we have plenty of funds, right? And uh, last year was my very first time to be able to serve the, that uh, group of community. And it was actually very, very uh, liberating. I, I you know, told my manager that was truly the highlight of my career, being able to put first time home buyers into a home at 3% down or uh, getting the 3% down payment assistance and closing cost grants. I never thought that I would come to a point to, to get that, and especially in a very competitive market. We all have uh, the duty to make sure that we make that accessible to them and, and sometimes uh, kind of have to, to do that and forget how our business model is. And, and for me, actually, it never hurt my business. In fact, it, it brought me a lot of business because those families will never end up will never stop thanking you <laughs> for mm -hmm. making it happen for them and has brought uh, me referrals this year. And they take a, a little bit extra steps actually to do that. It's not, you know, it's not as bad as people introduce it to me before. You know, they say like, if you have this stack of paper for your regular um, contract um, with the down payment assistance and grants, it, it can be double. No, it wasn't. It was just an additional five page, you know, for that. But we help a lot of families. And I think it's really, really important that we as a community in the housing industry get that education, regardless of which angle you're at. It could be title, escrow, um, because in, in doing one transaction, uh, a lot of a lot of the different angles actually happen. You know, as Chris said, oh, you never told me there was a second. You, you never told me you have this, but it is there. It's in the contract. You know, we presented it at the beginning, but it's the lack of um, awareness about the program. So hopefully um, I would say for all of us here uh, at this event, if you could, please, if there's one of your takeaway today, um, I think that is helping our community Build, build, um, build wealth uh, silently, right? Um, and being able to be the the person leading that and and giving them the access that I think they will not forget you and will bring you more um, in the future. Very well said. Thank you very much, and I think it's uh, time to turn it back to uh, okay. Janice. I think I we just, have. Um, oh, we have a question. Yeah, I think there's some. Some uh, just wanted to see what some of the panelists feel in regards to what we can do for some of our our minority communities in regards to um, the foreclosures and the um, moratoriums and. Um, uh, the forbearance, I think. We do need to guide our community in regards to what some of their options are. 
uh, as far as the forbearance, especially is concerned, because I know some, uh, some, a lot of people have actually done the forbearances and what are some of the things that they can do so that they can get themselves out of that situation. And if there's some things that's actually happening in the lending industry where they're saying, okay, we're going to work with you um, as far as, you know, because some lenders, everybody's doing it differently, how they're handling it differently. So just want to see if anyone has any feedback in regards to that. I wanted to bring up a couple things. I think um, with regards to the forbearance, I think um, I know we've used the word a lot, but kind of going back to educating our sellers, going on a listing appointment, um, have these conversations, especially after the last year uh, that we've gone through with your sellers. Did they, um, you know, a lot of times you ask as a listing agent, you know, what is your payoff? Um, but I think we need to further that discussion and ask, you know, did they go through forbearance? Did they do any kind of thing? Um, you know, with their, their lending institution. Um, I'm in a transaction currently right now and I represent the buyer. Um, we got the prelim and there was a lien on the prelim that the seller had no idea what it was. Um, it was with HUD and it was just recorded um, in April. And, uh, you know, I had asked the listing agent, she went back, talked to the seller because he said, no, I don't have a second on my home. I don't have this, this and that. And it turns out he went through forbearance and just kind of I'm not sure what he thought was going to happen, but it it brought up a conversation piece for sure. I mean, it was a fifteen thousand dollar lien, so have those conversations with your your sellers. I mean, especially right now, the market is to where your offers are going well above your list price. But still, I think you know maybe some sellers aren't educated in the sense of what's going to happen with that forbearance. So open up that conversation when you're going to listing appointments, um, you know, or if somebody's considering selling, just kind of talk to them about that. Because I think sometimes maybe some of them thought they weren't going to have to pay it back or, um, you know, anything with regards to that. So um, I did want to say one thing, I'm going to kind of divert right quick for a hot second. I know the biggest thing that we've talked about here is, is uh, wealth, you know, building wealth and through home ownership. And I think that um, what we didn't address, but I'd like to address is just our, our lack of housing inventory right now. And I just kind mm. of throw out to everybody to please, the biggest thing that we can do with regards to that, I mean, is to uh, get involved in our communities on local, state, federal levels. I know that NAREP has uh, a big, we're big on policy this year and addressing a lot of these things and issues. And I think the biggest thing that you can do, I know a lot of the organizations right now are having government affairs directors and we have an amazing government affairs director. Um, and we also have formed a national advocacy committee nationally for the organization. And it's so important for everybody to reach out to your officials. Um, and, you, and if you guys need help, I mean, we're more than happy to help you to show you what we're doing as an organization locally, reaching out locally, building those relationships, writing to our senators, our Congress about this lack of housing inventory and all these different bills that are up to be passed, um, what we can do, get involved with your chamber, um, just there's so many things. So I would say it, it's kind of our responsibility as well as we're trying to talk about building wealth. Um, the way to do that, we have to have the inventory, right? So it starts with us. And I just wanted to really kind of say, let's work together and find out how you can get involved in your community and, and start those relationships and take it to the next level. So that's all. Thank you, Adriana. That was fantastic. Thank you again. So the question is, how do we encourage others to get more involved? How? How do we get them to get more involved, get themselves, especially some of our great leaders that are in our community, how do we get them involved? How do we get them at the table? Any suggestions on that? Sometimes it's just an ask. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. You know, when they understand what the problem is and if they agree that if there is a problem, sometimes just asking is enough. Um, you know, I, I live in West Hollywood and I'm a commissioner for the city for the Business License Commission. Um, so naturally I'm very involved and I understand what's happening with housing and I speak at city council meetings all the time. I'm like, I wish there was just more people that would come and speak. And a lot of people just didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what was on the agenda for the week. And when I just simply would ask a few people to join me and to speak for 30 seconds to say you support this development or you support this or you're against this, um, people would show up and do it. So um, I think sometimes it could be just saying what the issue is and asking um, and just always nonstop doing that. And it, it works. It definitely works. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Anthony. And it's one-on-one -on -one call, right? It's not sending out an email or posting it on social media. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. 
And I, I totally agree with that, Anthony. I know that we as an organization were sending out links to kind of urge people to write our senators and our Congress. And so many people, you just ask and they say, absolutely, just show me, guide me how to do it. And they're on it like that. Yeah. So that is, I 100% agree. And um, and sometimes people shy away from policy a little bit because they're not kind of sure. And it's a little, can be a little intimidating if you don't know, but the, I mean, all we can do is take the first step, right? And support. So definitely just ask um, other people in your community what they're doing, how to get involved because um, it doesn't take a lot of time at all. It's more just the effort and taking that first step. I agree. You know, guys, thank you, ladies and gents. Thank you so much for being here today. And I think that that kind of sums it all for us is, is we need to just ask. We just need to ask others and other leaders in the community, come on board with us. If you know, And the, the thing is, is that our leaders in the community, they have such great connections that it's just a matter of, just like Anthony was saying, if you reached out to them and made a phone call, and Adriana said the thing, if you reached out and made a phone call and said, hey, you know, I need you to support me in this, you know, can you sign up for this? Can you do, and they'd be like, oh, okay, yes, I, I'm, I'm all for it. So that's what we're asking as well. Again, everyone, together we achieve more, together we are stronger, we just need to get to know everyone and just to meet everyone where they are and where we are so that we can really make a difference out there. Just want to invite everyone as part of SRCA, our uh, Housing Diversity Committee, I invite you all to join us. You can help us get a seat at the table and make a difference in our communities. Join us. Our next meeting is July 20th, 2.30. It's only for an hour. I promise we only take up an hour of your time, but we sure as heck can use you. We can use your voice. We can use your input. We can use your help because we as realtors and in this real estate community, we do have a job to do. And let us help show everyone how we're to take on this job and take on how can we speak up? And sometimes this is just a matter of a little bit of speaking up. And it makes someone stop and reflect, what, what did I just do? Because sometimes it's just, you know, it's, it's not even something someone's even thinking about. But anywho, we got a job to do. I need you guys all on board. I thank each and every one of the panelists for being here today. Alan, high five. You were fabulous. <laughs> you were fabulous. And each and every one of you on the panel, you guys did such a wonderful job. Thank you for sharing your insight. I think everyone on this call got something to take away and take home with and how they can share this with their friends, family, and community. And they can say, you know what? Anthony, Adriana, Ann, and Namir and Alan, they're out there doing, making a difference. And I want to join in. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you to our wonderful committee as well. If there's any other questions, of course, you can always reach me as well and put my email in the chat. If you want to join in on the committee, if you have any other questions on how you can help, we're here for you. Denise, you did a fabulous you. Thank job. You. Thank you, Janice. Oh, you guys. You thank guys you. were awesome. Oh, thank you, Denise. <laughs> Oh, Bye -bye. fabulous, fabulous. Thank you so much to everyone being here. Oh, it just warms my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I'm one of those heart on the sleeve, right? <laughs> Anthony, thank you. But I do want that invitation to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, we'll all just show up. Let's just show I up. know, right? We'll just all show up. We're going to bomb your wedding. <laughs> Anthony. <laughs> I know. You shouldn't have told us you were going to be in Maui. It ain't going to be hard to find. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. Anthony, oh, remember, time. together we're better. Together there we're you better. Go. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Nothing but love. Nothing but love. And that's what this is all about. It's all about love, everyone. Love sees no labels. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> okay, take care. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye, -bye. Everyone. bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Bye.